Our first speaker, uh, who's going to give us a, a, a longer overview, will be Raj Patel. We should be really honoured that Raj has come, come here to give a talk to us. Um, he's a very esteemed author, written a book called Stuffed and Starved, which is a global best-selling book. And it's, um, it's something I've really enjoyed reading, and I enjoy reading and listening to some of the things that Raj has said. And his alliance with the global food sovereignty movement has been very, very interesting, and I'm hoping you'll enlighten us a little bit on that. And without further ado, let's hand it over to Raj. Thanks, Deborah. Um, and th uh, th thank you very much for coming uh, and for being willing to sign up for the fight uh, for global justice. But part, part of fighting, uh, as uh, Milan Kundera once said, is uh, but part of the struggle is the, the struggle of memory against forgetting. Uh, and we need to have a better memory of what the G8... Uh, we need to be able to put this hunger summit that happened this weekend at Unilever House. It's very appropriate that this happened at Unilever House. The fact that the head of Unilever observed, he, he opens a summit and he goes, well, welcome to Unilever House. This place used to be uh, a palace, and then it was a poor house, and then it was a brothel. Uh, and then he asked uh, you know, the, the, recipient, the, the recipients of his remarks whether he thought that this was appropriate, and everyone chuckled. Uh, but it is appropriate uh, that, that, uh, that they were holding this at a bordello. Uh, because... Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it's important to understand why the G8 Hunger Summit is a reimagining re of history. And what they're trying to do is help us forget the history of hunger in the global south. But it, it, to under, understand that, let's go back, let's go back in time. Uh, because the, the summit that happened this weekend uh, at Unilever House wasn't the first time that governments and philanthropists and big business were getting together to fight hunger. They've done it before. And they've done it before in, in ways that have entirely reshaped global agriculture. Uh, and they've done it under what came to be known as the Green Revolution. Uh, just a quick poll. Have people heard of the Green Revolution? Quick hands up. Uh, okay. Uh, you may not know all of its history, though. And I think it's important to, to bear in mind that it began in Mexico in the 1930s. The Green Revolution starts as a response to something that happens in Mexico. And what happened in Mexico in the 1930s, 1920s and 1930s, was revolution. And in particular, uh, the, the regime of uh, President uh, uh, Avila, uh, no, uh, Lazaro Cardenas. Uh, and what he did in the 1930s was, uh, you know, propelled by workers' struggle, uh, was engage, in, and peasant struggle, was to engage in land reform. And he nationalized uh, the big businesses that were there. In particular, he nationalized the Standard Oil Company. Uh, so, the, the, what, what is now uh, uh, Pemex it w was, in fact, the U.S. corporation, the Standard Oil Company. Uh, and again, land reform, private property taken away from large landowners and redistributed to the poor. Uh, at the end of his reign, or at the end of his, uh, his, his presidency in the, the, the late 1930s, there was a, a, a sort of counter-hegemonic moment where uh, the uh, business leaders got in a, a different president. Uh, this is Avila Camacho, and one of the first things that Avila Camacho does is signal that he's going to be friendly to big business, and he's going to ban communism. You're not allowed to vote for communists in, uh, in Mexico after 1940. Uh, and this was the green light that U.S. business was waiting for, because uh, the U.S. business wasn't pleased about being expropriated. The, the, the Standard Oil Company was not terribly happy. And the Standard Oil Company, as you may know, was, was started by John Rockefeller. And the Rockefeller Foundation, in particular, was keen to, to come into Mexico and stop this kind of expropriation happening ever again. And so they start what they call the Mexican Agriculture Program, where they send experts into Mexico to try and grow more food. And the reason they want to grow more food is because they have in their mind this kind of Malthusian equation, right? this idea of, 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 of uh, what you need to do is to, to keep people well-fed so that they don't rebel, because if they rebel, they do crazy things like wanting communism. Uh, and, and, and they were very clear, very explicit about this, this idea that, you know, you, you, you have this sort of uh, population growth going, soaring through the roof, but uh, food growth is only going sort of arithmetically. We were talking earlier on about not using PowerPoint, so I'm asking you now to use your imaginations instead of using PowerPoint. <laughs> Imagine a geometric curve like that, an arithmetic one going like this, and where they intersect is where all hell is unleashed. Uh, and, and policymakers were very explicitly terrified of the moment where population outstrips uh, food supply. So the Rockefeller Foundation goes into Mexico and fights communism by trying to grow more food. 
So how do they do this? Well, they bring a young plant scientist, uh, Norman Borlaug, uh, from the United States, and he uh, starts developing crops, and these crops do so well, and they, they're so abundant uh, that they become a global success, and the U.S. government gets into the game and starts funding these things, and so you have uh, big business, uh, you have uh, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies who are interested in controlling fertility and helping to drop population levels, you have the, the, the agriculture companies that are selling fertilizer, uh, and you have the U.S. government, and you have the Rockefeller Foundation, and then the Ford Foundation, Foundation, this sort of mix of business, philanthropy, uh, and government, just as we saw this weekend. And well, well, so how do they do? Well, I mean, at, at some level, they do all right. I mean, the, the, they, they, they engineer these sort of monocultures of crops that do very well under controlled conditions. But it's interesting to look at the crops that they choose. So in Mexico, Mexico, the, uh, the, 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 the basic cereal that people eat in Mexico is corn, maize. Uh, and so uh, the, the uh, uh, agriculture program for the, the, for the Green Revolution invests in wheat. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that very purposely, because it's not about feeding the poor, it's about creating more food uh, for industrial agriculture to feed people in the cities. Right? They're not really worried about the poor, they're worried about urban, uh, urban workers rising up against the government. That's, that, that's what they're interested in controlling. So that's why they have uh, a wheat program. And then, of course, the, India is the next stop for uh, the Green Revolution. India, people eat rice and up north. And so the crop that they invest in in India is corn, uh, <laughs> is maize. Uh, and uh, again, th this is about uh, d developing varieties that support industrial agriculture, large-scale farming, and not the farming systems of poor people. Um, but again, you, you may ask, well, look, look, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that if you can, you can say to me that there, there was more food produced. And there was more food produced. It's unarguable uh, that the Green Revolution produced more food than before the Green Revolution. Uh, but... It's, it's also uh, the, the case that when you, uh, the, 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 that there was more hunger as a result of the Green Revolution. You, you have simultaneously the production of more food, and if you take China out of the equation, the world gets more hungry. Uh, and so, so, I mean, if you want to see the zenith of this, the kind of, uh, the, 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 the proof that there's something wrong with this picture, uh, look to 2010, where uh, we had more calories per person than ever before in human history, and a billion people going hungry. Uh, the Green Revolution, again, remember, it's about producing more commodity crops, but it's not about ending hunger for the, the world's poorest people. And, and you may say, well, all right, but, but, you know, at least some people got more food, and, and surely having more calories per person is, is fantastic. But the trouble is, of course, that these are commodity crops, and what you lose by enforcing these commodity crops on people is nutrition. Uh, and that's why it was very interesting that you know, the, 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 the G8 is now looking at nutrition and food security. I mean, there's an irony here. The, 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 the solution that, was, that came out this weekend was uh, an, an alliance for food security and nutrition. And this was an idea that actually came out of the United States. Um, and uh, it came out of the Agency for International Development. And the US Agency for International Development, in fact, it was the head of that agency that coined the term the Green Revolution. And he called it the Green Revolution in 1968 because it was the opposite of the Red Revolution of the Soviets and the White Revolution of the Shah of Iran. So it's the Green Revolution because it's not red and it's, because it's, uh, it, it's not about workers taking control. It's about pacifying those revolutionary tendencies. It's about pacifying workers and coming up with a way of managing hunger so that business can carry on as usual. And that tradition is alive and well now with the new alliance for food security and nutrition. Uh, because that was uh, hatched by a guy called Raj Shah, who's the, the, the head of the U.S. Agency for International Development now. Uh, and, he, the, uh, and, of course, there's an irony here. I just wanted to flag you know, America deciding to launch an initiative on food security when 50 million Americans, one in six Americans, is food insecure at the moment. Um, so you, know, you would think that they, they might have their work cut out for them at home, but no! Uh, in fact, it's about spreading a particular gospel, a particular vision of how it is that the world is going to be rendered less food insecure and less malnourished, is by essentially doing what the, 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 Coke, the Coca-Cola company did a few years ago. You know, you know this thing about Diet Coke Plus. Uh, a lot of people were pointing out to the Coca-Cola company, uh, quite reasonably, that Coca-Cola is not very good for you. Uh, and so the Coca-Cola company said, no, 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 we have a product. Uh, and they engineered something called Diet Coke Plus, which is Diet Coke plus a sort of sprinkling of vitamins. 
Uh, so uh, you, can, you can have your Diet Coke Plus of zero nu nutritional value uh, and then have a little bit of nutritional value added to it. But in fact, the, 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 number, the amount of vitamins that they added to Diet Coke Plus was so small that the Food and Drug Administration said, you're conning people. And the Food and Drug Administration lets, lets pretty much everything go. But even they uh, observed that there was something wrong with this idea of uh, you know, adding just a sprinkling of crap to something uh, and then adding you know, good for you, fortified. Um, now, that's, I mean, th th that's a bizarre kind of case, but that's exactly what the, uh, the, this, this new alliance is about. It's about taking a broken food system based on commodity crops and then tweaking it a little bit. And if you listen to Bill Gates' speech, uh, what he was uh, trumpeting essentially was the idea that we will, uh, you know, we will add nutrients to crops. So we've, we've created a world of monoculture of these large industrial agricultural crops of the, you know, the, the soy, the wheat, the maize. Uh, and, uh, and the rice, and now we're going to add vitamins to it. Uh, and that's the Diet Coke Plus policy. Uh, it's the idea of keeping business as usual, but adding enough nutrients so that people survive. And, and you may think, well, but, but, but there are people dying. And, and of course, this is one of the tropes of the conference, right? They, 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 had, uh, they had actually uh, uh, young African people who had been malnourished. And they were there, and they were saying, thank you for saving us. Uh, and you know, this, this sort of, I mean, this, this very racialized trope of the, you know, the white hand coming down and saving the brown people. Um, and that story is important. I mean, it's important to recognize that there is malnutrition that's related to poor diet. And one of the solutions that's being offered is something like uh, golden rice. You know the story of golden rice? I mean, golden rice is rice that's engineered to have more uh, vitamin A in it. Um, to prevent uh, blindness in children. Now, initially when they tried this, apparently it didn't work very well, and now rec recently they've been having uh, tests illegally uh, done in China to see whether it works or not. Um, but this misses the whole point. Even if golden rice works, the reason that children are going blind is not because their rice lacks vitamin A, it's because they're too poor to eat anything other than rice. But the one thing you never hear at the Hunger Summit is about the link between malnutrition and poverty. They didn't talk about poverty. You, 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 I mean, I was listening for the word poverty. It came up maybe five times. The rest of the time, it's all about malnutrition. You, and by tra transforming the problem of poverty into a problem of nutrition, you, you get to uh, you know, absolve yourself of having to address the difficult relations of power that produce poverty, that produce hunger in the first place. Now, that's something where I, I think we need to be looking for, for positive solutions. Because otherwise, you may say, well, look, you may not like the Gates Foundation. You may think that Unilever is uh, you know, a, a scam and, uh, you know, the, 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 you, you, you may think that the British government is just lying, but what if there was a different solution? Um, and you, and you, you, don't, you don't hear very much about what the alternatives to the, the, what the, the British government is doing here might be. Um, but the good news is that there is, a, a, I mean, there are a range of alternatives, and they fall under a rubric of food sovereignty. Um, now, food sovereignty is kind of the, it, it's very different from food security. Food sovereignty was an idea that was generated by uh, the international peasant movement, La Via Campesina. Now, what La Via Campesina uh, observed is that if your mission is to ensure food security, food security means that you have access, access to sufficient food uh, at all times. But Via Campesina was saying, look, you can have access to food and still largely be imprisoned by uh, the, 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 the economic system that provides that to you. You can, you can be food secure in prison, right? Uh, you, you, I mean, because you have access to food that's healthy and nutritious, uh, but you are absolutely unfree in the way of, of determining how that food comes to you or what it is that you get to eat, how it is that you make sure that everyone gets to eat. And so what La Via Campesina said is what we need is food sovereignty. Now, food sovereignty has a very long definition, and you can find it, uh, you know, find it on Wikipedia. But, but the, 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 the gist of it is this, that what we need is democracy in our food system. We need more of a say in how uh, our food comes to us. Um, and and you know, food so sovereignty is about every nation and community's right to have access to, to, to be able to shape its own food policy and shape its own food system. And you may say, well, you, uh, th th that's great, but, but what, what does that look like? Well, uh, the process of making sure that democracy happens. Uh, again, if you look at Via Campesina's site, th th they're saying, well, basically, in order for us to have a democratic conversation, we need the WTO not to be involved in agriculture at all. We need to remove agriculture from the kind of trade agreements that Deborah was talking about. Um, but having removed, imagine that we were able to pluck agriculture out of all of these international trade agreements. You may say, well, so still, tell me what that looks like. Well. There's an example that uh, I'm looking at in, in Malawi that I think is very interesting. 
Uh, and in fact, this weekend, Via Campesina had its 20th anniversary or last week. Uh, and they led with a, an idea that I think is tremendously important. Uh, when La Via Campesina celebrated food sovereignty, what they, what they understood was that food sovereignty is about an end to all forms of violence against women. Food sovereignty is an end to all forms of violence against women. Now, I mean, a second ago we were talking about trade agreements and how do we end up with violence against women? Well, the, the, the understanding of violence against women that Via Campesina has is uh, an understanding not only about physical violence, which is endemic and, uh, and absolutely needs to be fought, but also the structural violence, the structural violence of not being able to, to sell your, your product in the market, not being able to send your daughter to school, not being able to manage property, not being able to uh, control the destiny of your, you know, of your community and of your country. And so what they pointed out was that in order for food sovereignty to happen, we need democracy. We need genuine democracy and we need women's empowerment. Now that I think is very important because what you have here is a peasant movement. A peasant movement, that, and the word peasant in English, as you know, is a sort of backward and hopelessly sort of irredeemably stupid. Um, but a peasant movement is calling for a very 21st century idea of agriculture about women's rights, about new ways of, uh, of, of, of growing food. And so I, I want to give you an example of what that looks like in Malawi in the, the last five minutes. Do I have about five minutes left? Okay. So, he, 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 fantastic. This is, this is going exactly as I planned. Um, so, uh, in Malawi, um, Malawi is a, a dirt poor country, and uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it, its principal crop is tobacco. Uh, tobacco, is, the prices for tobacco being falling, uh, the, the Malawian currency uh, hasn't been doing terribly well, uh, and so things are pretty tough in, in Malawi. Uh, one of the ways in which Malawi wanted to, to uh, support its agriculture uh, was by doing something that I approve of, which is uh, to, you know, to, to, tell, you know, to, to give the World Bank the finger. Right? Uh, the World Bank for a long time has been saying, don't support agriculture as a waste of money. Um, the Malawian government said, no, we want to support agriculture. Unfortunately, what they did was to give free fertilizer vouchers to, to farmers. Now, on the one hand, you may think, well, free fertilizer vouchers, you know, did that work? In the short term, yes, it, it contributed to about 15% increase in yields. But uh, the, the, the problem is that they bought, these they bought this fertilizer in 2008, when the world price for fertilizer was at its highest, and the country went bankrupt. Uh, and so now th there's, uh, there's less fertilizer available and there is hunger in southern Malawi where this fertilizer program was alive and well. But in northern Malawi, the story I want to tell you about is, uh, is doing, uh, doing something rather different. There, they're using agroecology. They're using uh, ways of farming that are about growing uh, you know, the, the cereals that you want and then providing nitrogen-fixing plants so that the, the soil gets fertilized and then providing uh, leguminous trees that, that provide shade cover uh, because, because of climate change in Malawi, uh, the farmers are noticing that it gets too hot for photosynthesis to work. And photosynthesis stops at about 104 Fahrenheit. Uh, and so after that, you need, you need shade cover to provide an increase in yield. And so they're, they're, they're growing regular crops under uh, the, the, you know, this leguminous tree shade cover, and they're providing uh, ground cover to, to, to crowd out weeds and to attract beneficial insects, and they're using uh, foods that are nutritious, uh, you know, uh, uh, foods that are uh, rich in, in the kinds of vitamins that have been taken out of their diet, uh, and you have this fantastic agroecological system, and it's doing 15% better than the industrial farming. It's doing, it's, so it's outperforming in terms of uh, uh, the, the variety of crops uh, in, 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 that are coming out of the ground, uh, outperforming by 15% this industrial agricultural system. So people like it. But here's a, here's a quick question. So how is it that you can have more food in the fields and infant malnutrition goes up? How can you have more food in the fields and uh, kids are still, or in fact, increasingly malnourished. Infants in particular are malnourished. How, do you, how does that happen? Quick guess. No purchasing power, cash crop. Uh, th 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 that, that would be the case, but these are, these are crops that are actually grown for domestic consumption. So they don't enter the market uh, uh, in the same way as you would with maize or with tobacco. Guess at the back. Not distributing it, but uh, these are uh, the, 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 these crops are the, these crops are grown by families on their own land. So it, it, there's there's no intermediary here. Yes, sir. Ability to store the food. No, people have figured out ways of managing the storage of this food, so that, it, that that's not it. Yes. I'm sorry. It's too hard to eat. 
Oh, well, uh, no, it's not, it, but, but this isn't about infants eating this particular food, that you're close. One last guess, yeah. That's as close as we're going to get. The women are not involved in the distribution. And in fact, the answer is uh, that the reason uh, kids go hungry while there's more food, and it's nutritious food, uh, than ever before is because harvesting is women's work. But so is breastfeeding, and so is cooking and cleaning and fetching firewood and fetching water. So if there's more food to harvest, and you still have to cook, clean, fetch uh, firewood and water, then the breastfeeding can go down. And so how do you solve this problem? How do you solve the problem of... Uh, you know, of, of, of uh, harvesting being women's work. Quick, get. Get the men to work. Very good. Um, as we know, that's... Uh, how would you do that? Quick kick it. Swift kick in the bum. Um, the, the answer actually was, is very interesting. It, it's, um, they have what's called recipe days. Now, recipe days are these... Uh, you know, the, 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 these events where people come together and they're, they're cooking th this food and it basically becomes a recipe cook-off. Um, and the idea first is joyful. If you go to one of these recipe days, you'll see that it's actually a, just a whole bunch of fun. Um, two minutes I've got, okay. Uh, and the, and it's, it's important to have these things because uh, often the foods that are being grown are things like, you know, uh, millet and sorghum and cowpea. Um, and these are very nutritious. Everyone knows these are nutritious, but uh, no one really knows what to do with them. It's like kale. Uh, you know, <laughs> people, are, people are like, no, no, I understand that this is good for me. I have no fucking idea what to do. So, uh, so, so they have these competitions to be able to, you know, to figure out how to cook these things. Uh, but then also it's, it's a space where men and women are, uh, get to compete equally. And so men traditionally not allowed to cook or you know, not, uh, it's, it's not socially regarded as weird for men to cook. And they come into this space and all of a sudden they're encouraged to cook. But it also becomes a space then where women can call men out. It becomes a space of radical equality just for a little bit. Uh, but it becomes a space that's sort of like a prefigurative community, a, a community that where people are imagining how it, it could be for labor to be shared and for uh, the, the duties of fetching firewood and fetching water and uh, cooking together and cleaning up together, how that might be reimagined. Now, that's a kind of radical sort of grassroots democracy um, that is, that's very different from... Um, the, the, the vision of social change that uh, the, the, the G8 has. The G8 wants to centralize knowledge, uh, but this is about everyone sharing knowledge, not just about cooking, but also about farming. This becomes a farming knowledge exchange. The G8 wants to centralize uh, you know, ideas around nutrition, but this is about decentralizing ideas of nutrition. Uh, and it's about uh, people actually radically taking control and negotiating unequal power relationships, in this case, in their community. But food sovereignty is about renegotiating power relationships up and down the food system. And I think that that vision, a vision that, that I mean, if, if we are in the business here of supporting fights for global justice, then we need to be amplifying those kinds of spaces. And the way we do that, firstly, is to take responsibility for the damage that we have caused in, in this country, uh, but also by uh, actually fighting the, this new alliance and the way that it wants to crowd out a much more vibrant and much better food system. But in order for us to do that, we have to remember the, the, the long path that has been, you know, that, that's got us here with this new alliance and why it is so pernicious. But we also need to remember that we're, you know, why we're doing it. Uh, we're doing it so that everyone then can be able to decide their food system for themselves. That's what food sovereignty is, and that's the, the, the vision of global justice that I think we need to be fighting for. Thank you.